<laughs> it still doesn't trail off. I wish it trailed off. I should have like a little, that'd be nice, right? That'd be nice. Like it wants to do my hand. Hey everybody, how are you doing? Uh, afternoon. Uh, Five Watt World today is brought to you with the support of, well, you. Uh, today is the members of the Friends of Five Watt on Patreon. I'll talk a little bit on that, a half hour. Uh, I got an echo in here. Uh, let me get my own face off the screen. There we go. I don't have to look at that guy. Um, I've been a longtime fan of today's guest's uh, work. Uh, I regularly use his book, Fender the Golden Age, in past videos. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that book if we have time. Um, I always have so many great questions with these, these folks that are on. Um, uh, so when new, a new connection in the UK put me in within reach to have him on, I jumped on it. Um, in the past, I made two short history videos on Rickenbacker, uh, the Rick 12 and the Rick Bass history. You know, I rewatched the Rick 12 video today. I should just rename that. Um, Rickenbacker and the Rickenbacker 12, because the fact is I do about 10 minutes of the 30 minutes doing the background of the company. No, now we're near in the, in the level of detail as our guest This This is incredible. Um, uh, we're going to, we're going to have a good time. So uh, in each of those, I did a brief overview of the company. So if you want a, a thumbnail sketch to sort of add context to what we're going to do, we're probably going to drill down into the weeds a little bit to have fun um, I grabbed some images uh, that Martin sent me earlier. I have to tell you that I, well, I think I've said this before. I only have people on who make me laugh. So usually 10 minutes into this thing, I'm like red in the face from laughing at guests. No pressure on Martin. I can see him in the in the green room chuckling like, you know, no pressure. Um, uh, so I want everybody to go ahead and go. You know, if you need to take a minute, go get your Rick 330 or your Ricky 12 and sit down and settle in and join us for this. Um, uh, of course. I uh, got to do a little business. BV Ninja is here moderating for us. He is the man. And uh, pay attention to the chat for answers that you might have. Um, see, I shouldn't look in the chat because it's very distracting to me. Somebody said they met Tony Bacon. I actually got an email from Tony once and I was really early in the channel. And I have to admit that my head was turned just a little bit because Tony's written so much stuff. Um, so uh, watch for BB's answers. Um, if you have a question you'd like us to answer, go ahead and put it in the chat with a question mark and a space. And I will periodically through this bounce back into the chat to look at questions, though I do want to focus on the guest um, and not kind of have you watch me read the chat so much. Um, the music of the intro was my good friend Jason Lachlan playing the music he wrote for the Ricky 12 string history, short history. Uh, I had said that um, in my memory that I thought that might be a Rose Morris spec 12 string. And as soon as it came on the screen, I knew Martin was shaking his head like, boy. Keith just does not. Good thing I'm here, you know, because it's not. He's. We'll talk about it. I can see him laughing. Um, so that's Jason. And I mean, obviously, Jason's stuff's killer. Jason's got great courses on True Fire. You get, head over there and check him out. Uh, True Fire's got a Black Friday thing going um, with big discounts. And I promised them I would say so because I've been doing their courses. I've been doing the Fender Telecast, Top 20 Telecaster players to, that change the world. I've been working on that edit. Big edits like that are a slog, but I'm working on it. I'm hoping to have it out um, at the latest by probably given what, where we are today, probably at the latest um, Sunday, but maybe Saturday. I'm hoping to finish it tomorrow. Uh, very excited. That was a lot of fun. I'm going to give you guys, because you're here, a sneak peek. In the top 20 Telecasters that changed the world, number 20 is Jimmy Page. You have to go see the video to see why. If you don't know, you're probably filling the chat with the answer already. Uh, YouTube's making it harder for me to sling my merch at you. So I can go right around them. I got my toque. I was corrected by my friends from Quebec. Quebec, that's a toque, not a toque. Toque was a college thing. Uh, and um, so there's t-shirts and hoodies and all that kind of stuff there. Uh, also, um, the 5 Watt World David Barber bus collaboration. We sold out of those like that. And uh, thank you so much for all everybody who grabbed one. And um, we've got a bunch more coming online. I think David put up 15 last night and he's getting them finished as we go. And so uh, if you're interested, go grab one. Uh, I'll put that out of there. That's it. That's enough of me selling stuff. Let's sell some books <laughs> instead. I'll get Martin on here. Martin. Hey, hey Keith, how are you? Thank you. Good. I, I hope you're not too disappointed in me that, about that whole Rose Morris 12 string. Uh, it's all right. It's a very easy <laughs> mistake to make. Just got to look for the F <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, exactly. That's that's I will come back to that because you got some delightful examples right there. Some some real candy in the background. Um, we these are almost always really gear heavy kind of conversations. 
and you and I've had some really fun interactions. And one of the more kind of moments for me was we were going back and forth and I sent you an email and I'm like, well, can you get on so we could do audio and video testing? You were like, I'm going to a gig. So this book writing thing is not a full-time show for you. You, what do you do mostly? You said you were going to a gig as, as a manager. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, um, I've run a record label and managed bands for years and years and years. I, I started a label with my partner, Jeff called heavenly way back in 1990. And, did that for like 20 years and I've managed bands, but I'm, I'm in music, but I don't get to play as much as I'd like to. I do sometimes. So when you, you said you sometimes still do gigs with mates, um, when you go play, what do you play? I play bass usually. Oh, no kidding. What, <laughs> yeah. What, what bass well, do you, what, what's your, honest, uh, do you, do you have like a standing rig or do you change it up all the time or what? I use a precision bass through a basman or if I'm playing guitar, it'll, sorry guys, it'll be a Telecaster. <laughs> That's my sort of go to. If I'm doing a gig on six string, I'm going to play a Tele. Well, and I'll tell everybody here what I said to you. Um, I've had enough fun talking to you about guitars, and I'm, I'm going to tell a story about your backdrop there because um, it's not a green screen um, that <laughs> um, people might think so. Uh, if they know, the more they know, the more they might think it's a green screen. Um, that uh, that we might have a possibility to bring you back every once in a while. And you said that actually Fender and Fender Offsets is a real thing for you. And I'm going to lift your book. These are massive books. So I've got a clip. I've got a, an image of this. Uh, there we go. That's the <laughs> this is the second cover, right? This is second pressing. It was 30? actually the third. It was third actually pressing. the third. But yeah, well, that was the original cover we wanted. But the publishers wanted a Strat on there because they didn't think people would know what those other guitars were. And, the, and, the, and it's called... <laughs> The golden age and the first cover had a golden strat that's right yeah. boy <laughs> <laughs> what's, what's the line from the movie it's not a subtle point you're making i think yeah. is the expression we're looking for um so I, I, so the kind so what kind of tunes do you play when you go gig uh if i'm gigging i recently i was asked on a gig with some mates and i played uh nick low and some nick low covers you know, I like stuff like that. But I, I, I do also play offsets. You know, and I, I like jazz masters. You know, jazz masters. Plays. Yeah. yeah. Fenders are easy to play live. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So I wanted to start. I do like to do quizzes. Um, and I, I get so distracted by the chat because already everybody's got questions scrolling by and people are telling me what they're playing. Um, yeah. And people see I'm distracted already. Uh, so <laughs> I can't look there. So, but I am going to ask people to do a quiz. So I want to know, uh, we did this last time, I think, uh, two, two videos ago. Um, so here's the quiz. How many of you have a Rickenbacker in your guitar arsenal, your guitar group at home? So put a yes or a not yet in the chat, okay? And just everybody go ahead and answer that. And then I'll pop over there and we'll kind of get a sense of how Rick-centric our, uh, our audience is. And in the meantime, we'll move forward uh, with, uh, with the topic here. So you did the Fender book. It came out in 2010. Yeah. How did, how does a book like that, like percolate in, in your head and then kind of talk about the Fender book. And then it's a long time until you ended up doing the Rick book. And yeah, I guess I, I, I make the books with my brother and a pal of mine, Terry Foster worked with me on, on the Fender book, but generally it's me and Paul and they percolate for years. So I think we talked about doing a Fender book when we were kids because we got this little green book by Ken Archard, you know, and it's very inaccurate, black and white <laughs> pictures. And we just used to look at it like this. And you memorized we, it all wrong, right? Yeah. yeah, memorized it all wrong. You know, the broadcaster came out in 48, I think it said in there. And um, we just thought there was, all, we always thought there was something better to be done. And then when Tony Bacon's books started coming out, Tony Bacon's, um, early books like the ultimate guitar book Paul yeah. and it really enthused Paul and I that we thought these are good and Tom Wheeler had obviously written great books and, oh, yeah. um, and then Dutra Soir yeah of course I mean he laid down a lot of the foundation work of right. getting all these facts right you know and that was really really important so um, I think we were inspired by other people's books Richard Smith's books but we always felt there was something that we we wanted to do and that things could be better and um, we would talk about these things endlessly, but never even knowing we were going to do it. And then um, 
I think we just suddenly one day said, hey, let's do, do this Fender book. And so were you collecting material along the way? You, I mean, I'm going to talk, we're going to talk more about it specifically within the context of this book, but you, you've worked in the music industry and you've met a lot of people over time. You clearly, I mean, the, 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 to me, the thing that really sets your books apart is the access that you had to some of these collections. Yeah, uh, but I got guitars in here I've never seen, you know. Yeah, so we knew that was going to be an important thing. So I worked on various collectors in the U.S. Um, to gain access to some of the biggest collections. You know, Albert Molinaro, Brian Fisher, some of these guys had a thousand, two thousand guitars. You know, and right. we would get sent these lists, and it, <laughs> you know, well, <laughs> and. Um, there's probably for, for Fender the Golden Age, there were probably 450, maybe 500 guitars we shot that didn't make the book. Wow. Yeah. I mean, we could easily do a <laughs> second volume that's like, as with all the guitars different. Wow. Um, similarly, with Rickenbacker, we always we overshoot, you know, and then we're kind of then going to choose like what we're going to include. So, sure. but it's, it's, a, it's a fantastic thing, you know, visiting these collections and getting a sense of what, what's out there and what was made. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I actually, I've seen some inaccuracies in books before and it's clear that they're actually just, they're quoting somebody else because they clearly have never been in the room with the instruments. Yeah. You know, I'll, I'll build a video and I'll have this thing where they'll say that it moved to a bolt neck. And then I go looking for the, this mythical boat neck and I can't find one. I'm like, yeah. oh, okay, so that that's not right. He was just never in the room with the guitars. Yeah. Yeah. There's no substitute for holding it. You know, there's a, a guitars have got a DNA and you need to understand that, you know, that, you know, so there's no substitute for handling originals. It's the best way of learning about anything. Yeah. You know? Well, we kind of skipped over it. So you, you said you've been talking about it since you were kids. Your brother became a photographer. Yeah. And you became Maybe. a writer. Yeah, well, I don't know if I became a writer, but <laughs> I, I think someone had to write it. <laughs> you're, still, you're still becoming a writer. I know I the certainly feeling. certainly became a nerd. <laughs> um you know i became obsessed with learning you know and finding the knowledge and knowing about the stuff and i collect guitar literature you know i've got a huge huge collection of original guitar literature and you know i'm i'm a nerd i, I love all those details you know yeah yeah that's great <laughs> so um so let's nerd out on rickenbacker so yeah. we the rickenbacker book you talked about how the Fender book, you talked about it forever. Then how do you decide to do the Rick book? Was that like the other one that you really, I mean, clearly you have a bit of a commitment behind you there. Yeah. Paul, so Paul and I were in a group um, and Paul played a Rick, Ricky 12 string and it was a big part of our sound. So, and we were like big birds fans, big Beatles fans. And so these were guitars that we, we loved, you know, and mm -hmm. we loved the sound of them. And, um, then um, a pal of mine called Alan Rogan was always saying to me, "You should, you should write a Rickenbacker book." Uh, the late, the late great Alan Rogan, who's mm. Pete Townsend's guitar tech. Oh right. And uh, you know, he's a really good pal of mine. He was always saying, "You know, you, you, you've really got to write Rickenbacker." And I said, "Well, me and Paul have talked about that." And um, he said, "Look, I'm pals with John Hall. I'll hook you up." So I said, "Yeah." I'll I'll sit down and talk to John. John Hall's a noted Rickenbacker collector. John Hall, the owner of Rickenbacker. Oh, sorry, the current owner, right, yeah. right. The, the son of uh, FC. FC. Yeah. 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 It's not so, it's not many generations to get back to the beginning of Rick. No, but, no, no. Yeah. And John John remembers Adolf very well, who started That's the company. Wow. So John, when John was a boy, he remembers Adolf coming visiting them. So it's a very, you know, it's, the, the history's all there. So um, I met John, hoping he was going to fund me to write the book, <laughs> and uh, and he was we really, we had great talks, and he said, "Yeah, I'll let you into the archive, which they have the most they have the most amazing archive. They've got they've kept all their paperwork." And he said, "You know, I'll let you into the archive. You've got my blessing." He really liked the Fender book and what we'd done with that. That's beautiful. And uh, we I had some great chats with. With John, and then uh, I sort of said, you know, it's going to cost us like this much to make it. Here, I don't know. I don't, I don't want this to be a vanity project. You just go up and do it. Right, you'll so, be fine. <laughs> yeah. 
So uh, luckily, we Paul and I teamed up with a guy called Phil Highlander, who became our producer and you know helped us finance it and got the whole thing going. So we we managed to do it, you know, and um, yeah, it's, it's great, you know. Um, it, it is it was a dream come true, really, you know. So. Yeah. Nice. Uh, I I held it up, but I actually have a slide. I'm prepared here. Yeah. Uh, so this is the cover. How? What is on the cover here? What is the headstock to? That is that guitar there. Oh, that's no. a that's a three three six five. It's a 1966. You got to you got you to gotta grab it off the wall and flash the headstock for us. There we go. Be careful. It's expensive. <laughs> Look at that. Yeah. It, yeah. It, 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 there you go. It's that very guitar. It is. Oh, that's fantastic. That's great. <laughs> All right. It's not on the wall anymore. Well, you got to put it back. It's live. It's live. It's fine. That's perfectly good. All right. So I, I thought a good place to start because um, Rickenbacker had a lot of uh, firsts. So I thought you probably are the guy to run us through them because I think people don't realize how many things and how early Rickenbacker was building some things. And we were talking about it before we went live that sort of got stirred in and our thought of as innovative in 1950, but they happened way before. So talk a little yeah, bit. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're the first to make a commercially available electric guitar. I mean, that's why we're all here, right? So they're the first people to do that. Other people have been trying to make electric guitars under different ways, but they're the first company to bring one to market. And that's, you know, changes everything. Mm -hmm. um, they're the first people, because of that, they're the first people to make a guitar amp. Um, they had been making guitars with bolt-on necks as early as 1936. You know, mm -hmm. that's long before. Leo Fender's obviously of, often given the credit for, like, coming up with the bolt-on neck idea. It's a, it's a Rickenbacker thing. It's, it's, they'd already done that on an electric guitar before anybody else. Um, uh, lots of lots of things. So the, the horseshoe pickup. Talk, talk a minute about um, the horseshoe pickup related to like the earliest um, Gibson pickups. This is all around the same time period, right? Yeah, um, all well, borrowing from each other. Yeah, so the horseshoe comes first. Yeah, and the reason why it has the uh, horseshoe magnets over the top is to intensify the magnetic field mm -hmm. because it's still pioneering days, and they're trying to figure how to get the most out of and right. what that was really doing was making up for the amps they hadn't worked out amp technology yet so the preamps uh boosted the signal that was coming off the pickup mm -hmm. just wasn't good enough yet so they had these ginormous horseshoe magnets to intensify the field um but quickly uh, other makers uh worked out how to make the amps more powerful and didn't need the horseshoes so, but Rickenbacker stuck with the horseshoe for years and years, much longer than they should have done. Oh, well, because it kind of got in the way of playing. Sure. Your palm music stuff. Yeah, so it's great on a lap still where, where you're not do, doing it, but for a, they were put, fitting horseshoes to, you know, Spanish guitars way into the 50s. So into the early 50s, anyway. Did, did they see it as their sound? Was it? That, they yeah, I mean, it's a great marking? sound. It's a great sounding pickup, the horseshoe. Yeah, it's yeah. fantastic. Hmm. Um, it is a great design, but it's not well suited to to um, regular Spanish style playing. You know, it's right. going to get in your way. Sitting and playing, right? Yeah. And, and you you said that Adolf was around in FC Hall. So just real quickly for history's sake, uh, I had put it in their notes, and I shared my notes with Martin earlier. Um, I've always thought it's absolutely fascinating that both Gibson and Rickenbacker became sort of big guitar companies after the Rickenbackers and Gibsons were gone. Yeah. In both cases, because Orville died in 1916, but he had actually been kind of pushed out by a group of investors way before that. He was still sort of consulting, kind of like Leo at yeah. the 60s. Um, but um, but uh, Adolf um, was, had a, a partner, Beauchamp, right? Yeah, George, George Beecham, who... Beecham, thank you. Yeah, who'd, who'd developed the pickup. So okay. Adolf was more of a, a maker. So he was making guitar bodies for National and people like that. So he was a, he was a tool and die guy. So he was, he was the guy who could make the stuff. Whereas uh, George Beecham had come up with the 
pick up design so it was kind of together that they they made this electric guitar mm -hmm. but um uh beach beecham's name is difficult to pronounce as you've just illustrated <laughs> and uh they went with the idea of calling it Rickenbacker, which wasn't that much easier to pronounce. Well, and then it was still Rickenbacker, and they yeah. were spelling it that way, right? That's right. But um, Adolf had put most of the money up by this stage. Oh, okay. So it was kind of deemed that it would be named after him. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, um, so they were very successful at making steels. You know, that shouldn't be forgotten. So steel guitars were the prominent form of electric guitar for quite a while you know certainly mm. through the 30s and then during the 40s spanish style electrics are gaining as as these pickup designs mostly from gibson and epiphone and people like that were um you know getting better mm -hmm. rickenback had never kept up because they were stuck with this horseshoe design on their spanish mm -hmm. so they were falling away in that race so it was when FC Hall bought the company in 1953. He decided to try and get them into the Spanish guitar game. And that's when that really begins to happen. And, and you said that the guy in charge of the company now is his kid. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's it's yeah. just a short step away. That's what Yeah, so John, John, John um, was born into the company. And so he's never known anything that isn't written back. He's, he's fascinating, fascinating mm -hmm. guy to talk to. You know, I love John. Yeah. And his son Ben and his um, his um, daughter's husband Dan run the company now under John. So wow. it's very much a family business, just like Martin. You know. It's, yeah, and it's, and you've been out there, obviously. Yeah. The factory. How big is the company now? It's it's it by by com by comparison to other companies like Fender, it's tiny. Yeah, I mean, it's even, I, my impression has always been that it's kind of small even compared to what's become of the custom shop. From custom shops, I should say, Gibson or Fenders, they're like little guitar companies in themselves now, cranking out hundreds of guitars, you know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's it's small, but there's a great uh, attention to detail, you know, it's at Rickenbacker. They're right. still very handmade, although they use a CNC machine to cut the bodies and necks. They're mm -hmm. still finished by hand. It's a very, you know um that they they care a lot about um quality control and i think that that comes through in the instruments they make yeah we're going to talk more about that in a bit um so uh they they didn't keep up and then at some point they had the they had the i don't know i want to say with prescience to um hire roger ross Meisel. how did that come yeah, about that's just like an amazing happenstance thing I, roger had been out of picture working. that's him there you go um, well that's this is actually when he, when he was at fender that's we'll him at fender. That. yeah so that's late 60s yeah. so roger had uh worked for his father's company which was named in his honor in germany and he'd learned proper guitar making skills in um in Germany during the war as a child and was a very, very skilled guitar maker. But um, his dad ended up in prison, cut a long story short, for mm. smuggling in guitar materials across the east-west German border after the war. Mm -hmm. He wasn't doing anything dodgy, but he just was trying to make guitars. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> Roger ended up making a bit of a mess of the company and did a bit of a runner <laughs> and ran away to... to <laughs> to america he'd written to ted, uh, ted mccarty where all the black sheep go yeah <laughs> <laughs> and he'd he'd uh he'd written a letter to gibson and been given a position there but in 53 but that didn't really work out i think he only made one handmade guitar which they really didn't like well, and I and I need to say this because I, as I said, I just rewatched my um, Rickenbacker video, and I told you before we started, I took it out of a book as as gospel um, that they said that he had been there for two years. And if you look at the math of when he went to Rickenbacker, it sort of implies he was there at the being at Les Paul. You gave me chapter and verse like right off the top of your head. He actually went to Gibson when uh, in in late fifty three, and he was at Rickenbacker by uh, April fifty four. So yeah. he was there just a few months. He really didn't like it at Gibson. And I don't think 
a lot of the it, was, it wasn't long after the war and i don't think a lot of the uh, i'm told a lot of the dutch staff there didn't take kindly to him and called him a kraut hmm. so that didn't go down well so he fled for the west coast where more liberal attitudes at that time and a better climate <laughs> but yeah. he, i think it was just happenstance that he landed up just at the moment rick and becker were looking to hire someone and he was the perfect guy yeah and the fact is they pretty quickly recognized that his designs were unique and um appealed yeah he brought a really european flair to an american guitar company mm -hmm. and i think that is a design aesthetic that's endured you know right. it sets their instruments apart from all of the other manufacturers and it's really his design aesthetic that you can see behind me now mm -hmm. that, um you know i think he's a, a wonderful guitar very underrated uh, guitar maker and one of the things i really wanted to do with the book was really shine a light on roger and how important he'd been so in previous books well i don't want to name names but in, in maybe <laughs> <laughs> one of one of the early Rickenbacker titles. There's one. There was one paragraph on this guy who had done every, you know, done all the designs, and I just I had to know more. So yeah. I just dug dug deeper, and I I really wanted to find out more about this guy. So yeah, and he and he did the designs, the the three thirty, the three sixty, as you said, the ones behind you, the specifics. And we're going to talk about Rose Morris, um, and we'll talk about those specific guitars, of course. Um, but the the interesting thing is he eventually left yeah when was that so he left in 62 uh kind of august, just august. before things went insane yeah exactly right he, he left in august 62 uh he wasn't getting on with the factory foreman um who they just had a personality clash mm -hmm. and uh he wasn't getting on with him and uh, basically, Leo Fender poached him. Yeah, and, and I understood um, gave him a very sizable raise to boot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, Leo was looking to get into acoustic guitar production and right. semi acoustic guitar production with the Coronado. Yeah, he was so still starting from the three thirty five and not being able to play in that game. Yeah, yeah. And so he wanted in on that game. He wanted in on the acoustic market. Mm -hmm. And Roger could bring all these things to the company, and I, I think he did a very, Roger did a great job with those things that he, he brought. He also, Roger also designed the Tele Thin Line for Fender. So, if, if you think of the Tele Thin Line, that's basically a Rickenbacker. A Fender done as a, like a Rickenbacker. <laughs> so, oh, like that, the, so when you were out playing a Tele, do you play a Thin Line out of? <laughs> I, I, I wish. I think you should. I, I, I haven't got the money to buy them. <laughs> I'd really like a late sixties on, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we needed to make a priority. Here we yeah, go. that's right. Um, yeah, so if you think of the Tele Thin Line, that's it made in exactly the same way as a as a Ricky. It's a solid piece of wood, routed out from the back with a back stuck on it. It's just a Rickenbacker, but it's a Fender. Wow, that's very cool. Yeah. Mm. Well, I think we did. We did actually give him a little bit more of, uh, of a, a light here. And, and as you say, you spend a lot more time on it in the book. You sent me some amazing, I, I said, everybody, I said to Martin, Hey, Martin, send me like six or seven photographs that you want to feature during the thing. And, and I didn't get them. And I know he's really busy. I'm really busy. I'm like running around working on my edit. I get this folder from we, and I open it, it's 45 photographs. I'm like, <laughs> ah, what, what do you want? You know, which ones? So I grabbed about a half, I can only put about a dozen in the, in the stream. So I had the picture of Roger um, and, um, uh, actually it's time for my, it's time for my break for Patreon. I got to do my ad. I'm going gotcha. to put, put you in the green room. So you don't, you don't <laughs> have to, I, I don't want my guests to look bored during, <laughs> here you go. All right. So as I said, uh, today's live stream is brought to you by the friends of five watt on Patreon. I am scrolling down to my ad text here. Um, I want to start by thanking everybody that's in the Friends of Five Rot, all the regulars. A lot of the regulars are here. Uh, you guys know who you are and how easy it is to be in touch with me via the Patreon page. Uh, you probably already know I read all the comments and I do all the emails here. I always chuckle when people, I have lots of people like Bebe and Jeff and Jason and all these people that work with me on videos, but essentially I'm doing it from this small bedroom in upstate New York. And I always chuckle when people say, 
you know, I want to thank the whole team. And that's, and I pass those on, but it's usually me sitting here reading all those comments. Um, so uh, I'm in touch with the friends of five one on Patreon literally every day. And I, I absolutely, it's become the thing that I wanted it to be. It's the reason I called it five watt world uh, and not Keith's place. It's, it's a, a space for people. And to the extent, it's one of the reasons I started doing weekly live streams, because I saw somebody that did an, um, a definition of community. And they said, it's not a community. You're kidding yourself. If you like to call it a community, that's lovely. But if they can't talk back to you and you're not watching, listening to that, then it's not a community. It's just an audience. And you guys don't feel that way to me. So I try to do these and I'm going go to go to the comments here in a second. And I also did a, a live meetup in New York because I wanted to kind of test the waters around those things. Because it's really important to me to have the back and forth. And I've actually become friends with uh, any number of people through the channel, even though it's at a distance, some in other continents. Martin asked me where people were going to be logged on from. And I'm like, all over the world, if you could see the chat. And well, and it's one of those funny things where I have a sense of where a lot of you are. You've told me over time, whether it's Kurt or Victor or or uh, Paul or Jason, or, you know, I, I have a sense of where you guys are. So, um, or Scott, uh, Scott in Newfoundland. Um, so um, I, I love that. I love that about Five Watt World. I love that about the Friends of Five Watt. I like the idea that Patreon has a way that you can go direct. I'm actually watching their features. They keep adding things like where I could probably put up the videos. Um, so let me cover this. There's three levels of support. There's $5, $10, and 50. At the $10 level, you get early access to all the videos. And at the $50 level, if you want to do a live video call with me every month, I usually am delighted to do that. It's great. I, I always say 30 minutes and I always talk for, we talk for at least an hour. Um, so I really enjoy that. Um, and Patreon is adding features all the time. They're really troubled by the fact that YouTube is kind of, removing control from me and moving control more to their algorithm. I'm sure that helps their ad revenue. And I certainly deeply appreciate the platform that YouTube provides for me. Uh, at the same time, Patreon wants to have this more direct contact. I'm yammering on. Uh, there's lots of ways you can crowdfund Five Watt World. Um, Patreon is just one of my favorites and it makes it easy back and forth for everybody. Uh, there's a link in the description and I want to thank everybody for listening and let's get back to it. We'll get Martin back in here. There you go. Hi. How's that? How's my, how's my ad copywriting? What's that? How's my ad copywriting? I like it. I, I'm going <laughs> to sign up for the 50, I think. <laughs> Good. We need a chat every month. <laughs> we, could, we, could, we could just turn the cameras on and do this every month. There we go. Um, okay, so we talked about Roger. And, uh, and I wanted to talk. Oh, you know what? I want to see. Let me scroll back. And see if people see if people were doing a good job with the um, yes or no, or if they actually. I find that people love to say what they have, and if I look, yeah, see, I'm looking at it, and I'm going through the. Rob Nemitz says uh, weather in Kalamazoo is why Roger left. I guess that guy's been to Kalamazoo as I have been, um, and see, there's a guy here. Steve Lucy's got three. He's got a six, a 46 Bakelite steel. An 88, 36, 20, and a 2010, 630. Okay. And other, other people have some really lovely ones too. There's, there's a guy right down the road from you. Says, somebody says it's pissing down rain in Bristol. Yeah, he's yeah. not far. No, that's right. Uh, yeah, see, people are listing them. They want to know if the uh, if a thin line, Jeff Cat Buckeye wants to know if a thin line would be a telebacker or a Rickencaster. <laughs> We can decide. We're, yeah. in charge. We're in charge here. <laughs> so uh, let's see. So it looks like we had quite a few Ricks, but it is what I expected. Um, I think, I think that Ricks are, and let's talk about that now. I think Ricks have always been. Um, I was struck by the prices adjusted for inflation when I made my video. I think I did the video two years ago, three years ago, yeah. on Rick Twelves. Rick Twelves were crazy money. Yeah, yeah. So they were um, like t t twice as much as a strat, you know. Twice one as the, much. One of these, yeah. Yeah. Was, was like twice as much as a Fender strat, you know, it was considerably more. And the know? Stratocaster was like the premier guitar at the time. Yeah. So, I mean, I think the only guitar that might have been more expensive in the UK, these, these, are, these are Rose Morris models here. So, yeah. Um, 
the only guitar that was probably more expensive in the UK was like a White Falcon, you know, the only that you might buy than a Rickenback twelve string. But um, it didn't deter people. They, the Brit, you know, the British, they really found a solid audience in Britain. Yeah, and um, got into the hands of some very, very important players, as, as right. you know. Yeah, we're going to talk about who you think the big ones are. Um, if we have time, we'll try to get through some. Boy, we got so much stuff to cover here. Uh, the the interesting thing to me is that because of the bands that played Rickenbacker, who put them on the map, I, I, I've said this here, I was born in 1960. So I kind of grew up with the Beatles. And by the time I was 10 years old, the Beatles were done. And my dad was a high school art teacher. So there was just Beatles playing in my house all the time, along with the Kinks and Me too. Seeger and all that kind of stuff. Right. Yeah. So, um, and then, and then even bands like Tom Petty who went to England and did well. And, you know, after the first, after, in the fourth record, then all of a sudden there's 12 strings on it. I'm like, well, wait a minute. So this is a British company. No, it is a California company. Yeah. It is a quintessentially American brand. And, yeah. they, and they've always been a lot of hand finished work, very small company, though they get they did get bigger in the 60s. I, I don't remember the numbers, like how big they grew, but then they they had some hard times. They pulled back and they've kind of stayed the same now for a couple of decades. Right. Yeah. I mean, it, it, when the Beatles played them, um, it, it exploded, you know, what, like all guitar makers after the Ed Sullivan show, right. everything just went bang, you know, and. And Rick and Back struck like every maker struggled to keep up. Um, but in degrees of scale, you know, I think Fender had to sell up to, or well, it resulted in Fender selling up to CBS. Yeah. Rick and Back's workforce rose from about 30 up to about 120, which is right. a big increase for a company. Huge. Yeah. yeah. And, and that was like in the space of 12 months. Right. So um, uh, they were just, you know, making a lot of guitars then but everyone was <laughs> well and and beve um had a question he got to me before right before the stream it's very germane right now he wanted to ask when you thought was the best like what are the golden ages for rickenbacker what when are the best production what are the best years uh for quality and those kinds of things mid 60s um mid 60s <laughs> and now <laughs> They it's make very said. good guitars now, yeah. Yeah. The, yeah, the yeah. quality control is, is amazing now. You know, it has been for probably since John John Hall took it over in the mid '80s. When John took it over from his father, he really got the company back on its feet, and they've they've really kept a good level of quality since then. Yeah. But like all makers, I think the '70s and certainly the '80s, early '80s, was dropping off. Right. Well, I, I, I've got so many questions and it's already 440. Let's talk Rose Morris. Yeah. So, so this is fascinating. Um, the reason that I wrote, to, I wrote to you earlier and I said, talk about Rose Morris and Jennings. Jennings had reached out to Rick and Backer, but in the end, Rose Morris was the only company, sorry, and everybody might not know, Jennings eventually did Vox and that was like this whole other distribution possibility, but it was Rose Morris that distributed Rick in, yeah. was it just the UK or was it in Europe? It was uh, a in, into Europe and into Australia. So they were getting guitars into the UK and they would sell some into Sweden and okay. Germany and sell some into Australia. But everyone was chasing Rick. As soon as the Beatles came out with this guitar that John was playing, wow. everyone was ch chasing them and they were like, what is this guitar? Where did it come from? Right. So everyone was chasing after them. Selma, Vox, Jennings. Um, but Rose Morris took the initiative to just jump on a plane and go to LA right. just to do it. And they got to the Rickenbacker showrooms in December 63 and selected a range. And when they placed an order for 600 guitars straight off the bat, this was probably, <laughs> yeah. um, it represented about 50% of what Rickenbacker had turned out the year before. Wow. So it was like a huge, huge order. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and you said 63. Yes, yeah, December 63, they, they landed. And then they Rickenbacker began making guitars for them in January 63. So they were making this, this order for 600 guitars. So it was right. I mean, like a month before the Beatles run. It's like, oh, yeah. So, oh, it, my God. The timing was incredible. So then Rose Morris suggest that um, 
FC rights to Brian Epstein, which right. FC Hall does, and gets a private audience with the Beatles the day before the Ed Sullivan show. Right, when they're in New York. But, and that's yeah. all in my video. There's beautiful photographs of yeah. that. And I, you sent me a great photograph of um, George playing a 12-string, obviously in a hotel room. Yeah, so he's in bed. Yeah. So <laughs> FC, FC um, gets together all these guitars in a hotel room in New York. Right. George can't make it because he's sick in bed. Right. Uh, John Lennon sees the 12 string, says, George is going to like that. Can we take it to him? Right. And so so the, they're, they're on to... the other side of the park is the way. Yeah, the that's right. And they yeah. walk across the beach. So they literally, everybody kind of gets, they get their coats back on and they go back across the park. Yeah. And there's all yeah. these photographs of them walking across the park. Yeah. And FC's carrying the case. Yes. Yeah. And they give the guitar to George. So the picture I sent you is George in bed playing his new 12 string. Right, because he just didn't feel that good. Yeah. Right. And then this picture is the one that I pulled because I, I love uh, the Beatles uh, case there. Yeah. Yeah, and then you can see John with his in the background. Yeah. Yeah, of course the Gretsch is right there in the foreground. So we'll, yeah, we'll enjoy yeah. that. There we go. George, George adored that guitar, you know, and it, you know, it, he played it straight away yeah. on their records. So. And it changes a lot, you know, in that mid 60s sound. Everybody starts playing 12 string electrics. So, right. So, as and it, it's interesting because that Rose Morris deal, I never put two and two together that what you just did for me, um, that that happened before 64, before the January 9th Beatles show at Ed Sullivan. And, <clears throat> um, and then the 12 string happens that, you know, right on the heels of that, too. He uses it right away. Yeah. On all and then Rose Morris, right to, right to the like days after George's back. They say, "What's this twelve string? You didn't, you didn't show us that. Now come on, we need, get we're going to need those. Yeah, we're going to need those. We need those now. Why didn't right. you show it to us? Right. You know, it's it's interesting. We could. I'm realizing we probably could have spent an hour on Rose Morris and Rickenbacker because there is so much to detail to. It's well, it's it's the guitars behind you. So let's just talk about it. When uh, I'll tell this story real quickly because I don't want to spend too much time. When when I initially got online with Martin. Um, he was sitting at his desk and I'm like, oh, we need you to have a backdrop where you got some, are there some guitars or something? Is there something? And you moved your laptop and kind of like Blair witched me over and you set the laptop down and you started talking. I can't even remember what we're talking about because up on the wall behind you, you know, it's that, it's that choir of angels sound you made earlier. Oh, it was like, <laughs> he had a whole wall of uh, custom collar, matching headstock, early sixties Fender 12 strings. And I say a whole wall, just the, the space around his head. And I, I couldn't concentrate. I'm like, wait, 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 what are those? And so then you told me that you had started collecting them really early on. And yeah. like I said, we spent an hour on that, but we won't. And then, um, and I said, well, it's, that's, that's amazing, but it's a shame you don't have like enough Rickenbackers to kind of, you know, for the live stream. And your, your response was, oh, they're on the other side of the wall. I'll get those and <laughs> they'll be there. We'll have those up. That's, that's, I've got that covered. <laughs> so the, the thing that I noticed when we got on the other day and you had put these up, Rose Morris, they wanted unique things and they use their own numbering system, but they, they're the ones who spec that more traditional F hole. Yeah. That. I think, I think that scene, um, that scene a little, um, three, two, five, like the Lennon model uh -huh. with an F hole, but mm -hmm. then the three thirties they saw had the slash. Yeah. But because, the cat's eye. Yeah. So they want, they just said, could we have this on there? They were just didn't know, you know, and FC sure. said, yeah, I can, I can make them with that on there. That'd be fine. Yeah. And so they just ordered it that way. Um, and they wanted all their guitars to have a vibrato. Okay. So models that didn't normally have a vibrato were suddenly fitted with them. And so all the guitars had to have a vibrato. Um, and it was just like a kind of order that was thrown together. And then they saw a 4,000 bass. Yeah. I was going to say, well, let's get the picture of Maca with his 4,001 S. Yeah. So they saw that bass, uh, with one pickup and they requested it with an extra pickup. Right. But that actually what Mac is playing there is, is commonly known as a 4,001 S. Right. But it's actually part of the first run of. Rose Morris bass is not a lot of people know, no, not a lot of people know, this, but um, <laughs> it's, it's one of the first, um, it's, it, it, it's serial number falls in the first batch of Rose Morris basses, 
it's just one of them but it's left-handed made specially for paul mm -hmm. and taken to that hotel meeting just before the ed sullivan show but he didn't want it well they offered to <laughs> they offered to sell it to him is the way i, I believe heard it. so yeah 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 that's the way i heard the story and then and then he was like yeah i like what i got you know for yeah. money you know and they were giving george a guitar but they didn't give him a bass like, yeah yeah so um a, a year later uh, uh, 18 months later they they would give that same bass to paul in in um LA. Right, when they were there for the Hollywood Bowl show. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So John John himself, John Hall, who runs the company now, was handed that bass to Paul. Because he was a kid, right? Yeah, he was just a kid, but obviously he wanted to go out there and meet them. Well, and the whole and the way I heard the story was the whole family got to see them play a pair of Ricks on stage. Not the bass, but but uh George and John went on stage to they they opened with Twist and Shout, I think, and um, and they were both playing Ricks. So like, what a yeah, moment, yeah. Company, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Lovely. So, um, um, so the 12 string, the introduction of the 12 string was huge for Rick. Yeah. 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 Right. And the so amazing that, thing is that you say that those were some of the best years when in fact um, the company was growing so fast. I mean, that they kept quality up. Lots of companies had a real hard time. Um, so it, it broke some companies. I mean, Mo's right. I'm not saying their quality fell off, but Mo's right. Basically what it took to start a guitar company is not the same set of skills to run a guitar company, especially a yeah. bigger guitar company. Yeah. Um, so he had been a custom maker and then he, he just couldn't go to production. And so that's why those, you know, handmade ones are so rare. Um, but these guitars were, were solid, you know, for a long, long time there. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's, there's always been a, I think it's instilled in in the Hall family that they they've got a sorry I just did that um, they've got a, <laughs> they've got a, a good you know they they're very concerned with the quality of their product and I think that that shines through and always has been so the other thing about the the Maca four thousand one S because he played it and everybody if we went back to that picture it's a right handed neck on a left on a custom left handed body that they built yeah. And the reason it's the lower end model, it doesn't have the shark fin inlays on the neck. It has dots and it also doesn't have binding on the neck. And people were kind of like, well, we want what Paul has. And yeah. so Rose Morris started selling those. And a lot of famous people, that's the model they play for exactly that reason. That's the model that Chris Squire with Yes played. Yeah. So Chris Morris had a, had a Rose Morris. Interestingly, though, Paul's usage of that bass wasn't public until 67. Right. So he had it and he was playing it on rubber soul and revolver, a lot on revolver. And, um, but people didn't really know that he played it. It was only uh, in 67 when they go live on TV and he's made his psychedelic. I think a whole bunch of people just suddenly saw that bass for the first time. Right. Right. They didn't see it in public until he'd already stripped it yeah. and then painted it. The and guys like Chris Squire and, and say the, um, Pete Quay from the Kinks, yeah. they were just buying them. Regardless, they didn't know Maca had one, you know, it's just right, right. Yeah. So unlike the 12 string, which became very visible right away, yeah, very influential, not just the sound, but it like you just said, the spawn, the birds, and um, and then everybody wanted what he had, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so so George's use of his 12 string was instantaneous. He was on Ready Steady Go, he was on all these shows, and suddenly have all, all these British groups wanted Rickenbackers, you know. And then you'd get all these British invasion bands going to America. And it was the first time Rickenbackers were getting a lot of exposure on American TV. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly you get this whole wave of American garage bands mm -hmm. and they all want that British look. So Rickenbackers exactly. exploding. Yeah. 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 Um, one of the things I absolutely wanted to do with you, because I'm, I'm going to buy questions because we're running. Out no, long, no, that's fine. Uh, is um, who do you think, besides the Beatles and the birds and the obvious ones in the sixties. And we can go back and maybe there's important people that I'm not mentioning. Um, who do you think the most important players that had the biggest impact on Rick and Backer sales have been? And I was thinking we could probably do it, you know, by decade or yeah. just, yeah, just do them in, in chronological order. We, we named the guys in the sixties. Yeah. Um, yeah. So in the seventies, Chris Squire, definitely. Yeah. Uh, huge, you know, for the base, I think where Macker is, got that off the ground, the Rickenbacker bass, and got people into it. 
uh, Chris Squire just blew it through the roof. You know, I think it's kind of hard to understand how influential they were at that time. Yes. Um, then Lemmy. <laughs> right. Um, uh, so the bass is kind of dominated by the seventies is quite dominated by the bass, but then at the end of the seventies, Paul Weller really comes in and pushes the six string, you know, and he's using it because of Pete Townsend and, the, and, the, and the Beatles. But um, I reckon Paul Weller was selling a lot of 330s for that company, you know, at that time. Right. And they were probably unaware. Why, why are all these orders coming in from, from Britain? Because they, they don't actually endorse him. I asked Paul and he said he had by, he had 17 Rickenbacker 330s. <laughs> he bought all of them <laughs> and, and smashed about half of them. <laughs> And, and uh, I'm sure everybody, you know, assumed that he was getting them shipped. And yeah, that's a, that's a lot of scratch. I mean, that's a lot. That's a lot of Rickenbacker money there. Yeah. 17 of them. Wow. Yeah. So, um, well, I did definitely did a lot for, you know, um, players. And then then along in, in the 80s come Johnny Marr, I think was really important. Right. You know, Johnny Marr's usage of, of Rickenbacker is really, really important. He played it on some of that. There was a wonderful, recently there was a wonderful interview on that pedal show with Johnny Marr. He's talking yeah. about, his, he's talking about his book and, um, and you said that you and Paul were a little bit involved. Paul did some of the photography. No, uh, Paul didn't do any photography. I, I, I'd have liked him to, but they used a great oh. guy called Pat Graham. I, I did the, um, I did a long interview with Johnny for the book, which was great. Oh, that's right. That's right. I remember yeah. that now. Yeah. Um, so, um, but, but he talks about the fact that he wanted a Rick because of the people that came before him. Yeah. Because he wanted that jangly arpeggio thing. Yeah. And of course- you What know, Johnny says is he wanted a rip because it wouldn't make him play like certain other styles. He wanted it to, you know, confine his style to right. playing that arpeggio, play differently. Yeah. And it certainly succeeded in doing that. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So then after him, maybe Chris Buck, R.E.M.? Uh, Peter Buck, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, Peter Buck, yeah. sorry, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, yeah, he's really important. Again, very arpeggio style. Yeah. And um, he uses incredibly heavy strings to get that. He'll use 14s. Yeah, to 58s. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Basically, basically treated it like an acoustic. Yeah. Almost, yeah. Yeah, but he's he's got a great style. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Susanna Hoffs was always playing Rickenbacker. And, right, with the bangles eventually. Yeah, and I, I interviewed her for the book, and she was amazing. You know, she's really really loves loves those instruments so yeah she has a pretty active youtube channel where she comes on frequently and talks about how those things happen in her career and stuff and you know she still kind of talks about her career with awe which yeah I think, I think it's charming you know that's that yeah that somebody who's was as big um as she was and is still enjoying music and is still active and it's fascinating yeah yeah she, she was a really good person to interview for the book yeah that's great so then um are there current people that we should know i mean i think uh, we went by marty wilson piper in the church there were other people that were kind of doing the same thing or yeah. sort of tapping the vein of the of the the past for for tones in the 80s and 90s yeah the guitarist from timing parlor he's always using a rick and gets good sounds out of it cool um against me you know that that group um they're, they're, they're still out there, still people use. The basses, you know, they can't make enough of them. Oh, is that right? Yeah, yeah, they, you know, they could sell those basses all day long. They're great, they're great basses, you know? Yeah, uh, that's great. So let's get back to talk about the book. So the book was released when? It, it was, we, we self-published it under okay. a different title, but those are, those, that it was called out of the frying pan into the fire glow. Oh, right. Yeah, two years ago. Yeah. And we did like a sort of like limited run of those. There was a special like collector's edition done. And then uh, Cassell Illustrated, which is part of Hache, came to us and um, they wanted to pick the book up, which was great. Yeah. So we thought we would just retitle it. Um, to mark a distinction between that early version and this, it's essentially the same book. There's a few minor changes, but it's 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 essentially the same book. New cover, or is your yeah new cover, new title, and yeah. some minor changes in there. 
it's definitely worth having both. <laughs> <laughs> I actually have uh, a book. Um, I'm not going to remember the author now. This is so embarrassing. The uh, PRS did fund a guy to write a history of their of their book and of their company, and it's yeah. wonderful. And I talked to the guy on the phone, and that's why I'm so embarrassed. I can't remember his name because it was a long time ago. But then they did an edited version. And I and I wrote him. I'm like, they say this in the book. He goes, that's the edited version. I'm like, oh, OK. He's like, I didn't write that. So, um, so you're saying that there's just more in the new book. Yeah. 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 That's amazing. Um, uh, I have two things. So yeah. you, you said we got to nerd out. You have two those two Rick 12s of behind your head. Um, I, this shows my uh, obsessive compulsive, you know, whether it's a disorder, people have to judge for themselves. Um, they have two different tailpieces. But you said this is a short, This that they only built 100 of these. We were laughing before the stream started that there's over 1,700 less Pauls, uh, 59 bursts less Pauls or whatever, and 58, 59, 60 less Pauls. And you're like, yeah, in my world, that's a ton of guitars. This is 100 of these. And You are very observant to spot that. Well, I, um, I, I'm, so, I'm, 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 I suffer and I'm, I'm both <laughs> gratified and suffer from it. So, so what's up with that? Okay. So you've just spotted something very, very, you know, um, a fine, fine detail. So this one, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> this we'll is called this. a stubby. Yeah. And the first 25 were made in this style. And that's uh, the tailpiece you see on George's guitar. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, the first 25 Rose Morris were made like that. And the, the, the 75 that followed it came with the R tail piece. Yeah. Um, but they have a different truss rod cover shape as well. So the, oh. the, the one with the trapeze has a short truss rod cover called a stubby. And then you get this longer one. But that's train spotting detail. <laughs> love it. That's great. Well, and one of the things I loved about when I was doing the original video, I can't remember where I got the detail, maybe from Tony's book or something. Um, it was that swooping headstock, that swooping um, truss rod cover, and the new logo was designed by FC Hall's wife. Yeah. Um, <laughs> she came out with the shape, the yeah. limited shape. Okay. I'm not sure if she designed the logo. That I've tr tried to find out. Okay. I'm not sure who designed the logo. It's very much like a car period car logo with yeah. that underlining. You know, you can right, make right. it prime very easy. Yeah, but, it's like um, with the way the, the H is done, it looks like it's a continuous, you know, almost like you could have done it with a router, you know? Yeah. Wood or something. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, but, um, yeah, uh, FC's wife uh, mm -hmm. came up with that. Right. She's cool. Well, and that's a very 60s Gibson, you know, Fender, Southern California. It's like all these companies, they, these guys knew each other um, and and there's all these things happening. And you always think, oh, well, they must have had a big design firm that they worked on that with six months. No, no. His wife did it on a napkin. Yeah, yeah. The shape. And so I think she cut a pair of scissors on a bit of paper. <laughs> Wouldn't it be good if it was like this? This would be good. Yeah, yeah. it's lovely. Sweetheart. Thank you. You know, and, there, and now it's on guitars forever. I love yeah, it's that. A, it's a very good trademark. Yeah, I absolutely love that. Well, as I predicted, the hour flew by. We are we are at, at an hour. I could talk all night. <laughs> yeah, well, I, we, we had a really good time talking about this before. Before I let you go, though, you, you said that you reach, the, one of the questions that I wanted, and everybody always asks this of, of me and, and friends um, when they do videos, they're like, where'd you ever get those backing tracks? Or where did you get that? You gained access to these um, these photographs and things um, and, and you were saying earlier that you had hundreds of photographs that you didn't use. You really, you contacted people in collections, you flew there, you'd set up with your brother, Paul would set up sort of an impromptu photography studio and you would just shoot. Yeah. Hundreds of guitars. Yeah. So we, we take like a back roll and all the lights and we've got this particular setup because we want the guitars to look like they're in the same place, you know, wherever we yeah. shot them. So there's a con continuity through the book. So yeah, we would with so a lot of the places we've been, you know, it's it's incredible. A big part of it for Paul and I is, is the road trip. You know, we like like getting out there and meeting the people that own them, and yeah, it's good fun. It's great. And didn't you tell me that you were going to be in the states again really soon? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm out next week um, to see a very big collection, which I'm really excited about. Okay, which, you know, so is I'm there going to be a book? 
I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell uh, you in a few months. <laughs> where that one of these months when you're on, we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll just leak that out. Just get that yeah. out there with the cover. All right, good. Well, Martin, I want to really thank you for being here. I, I, I learned a lot talking to you and it's been a lot of fun. And it's not just about Rick's. It's just been just a lot of fun talking to you about different things. I, I you know we could have you back and talk for an hour about how you started collecting because you said there are a hundred of those Pete Townsend models uh, in the background. Well, it's not the Pete Townsend signatures. Those came later, but you said there's a hundred and there's two right there. And you yeah, don't even know how many there are in existence anymore. I reckon maybe 50, but right. maybe not even that many. Yeah. Well, and people would, anybody on this stream would appreciate that when you said that you had two of them, I'm like, well, if you have two, then you can let me have one. And you're like, <laughs> Oh, that would be, would you say it would be a very expensive that would be a very expensive acquisition. <laughs> <laughs> that would be an expensive moment to have. So we've decided to just not do that problem. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Again, thanks a lot for being here. Like I said. No, it's maybe... really good, Keith. I loved it. Thank, thanks so much yeah. for having me. Yeah, it was great. I think we will have you back to talk about collecting and how that happened. Because like with the, with the fenders, you had pointed out that you started really early, that you've been collecting for a long time. Yeah. When I, when Paul and I, when my brother and I first got into it, Old guitars were cheaper than new ones, so it made sense. <laughs> Everybody here would love to hear those kinds of stories, I'm sure. Yeah. So we'll have you back. And uh, again, thanks. And I'm going to pop you back in the green. If you hang out, then I can do. we can do a quick debrief after I've signed off, okay? That would be fantastic. Great. All right. Cheers. See you. All right, everybody. Hey, thanks for being here. I, I didn't have a lot of time in the chat. I really apologize. But as you could see, I knew that Martin was going to have a ton of really cool stuff to talk about. Uh, I really appreciated it. Um, and uh, like I said, uh, I would, uh, a book. <laughs> everybody's going, a book, thanks. Yeah, what, what do you know, a book? Uh, so um, I, I wanna thank everybody for being here. I'm gonna have Jason Lachlan play us out. And uh, next week at Thanksgiving, probably won't do a show, but maybe a different day. I'll put an announcement up. Uh, if I can pull something together, I really appreciate it. And um, I'm gonna run the music. Thanks again. <laughs>